This is day 17 of reading Revelation. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her, because there will be no more markets for their cargo, their cargo of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple silk and scarlet cloth, fragrant wood of every kind, all articles of ivory and all articles of the most expensive wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh and frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves, that is, human beings. The fruit you craved has left you. All your luxury and splendor are gone. Never again will one find them. The merchants who deal in these goods, who grew rich from her, will keep their distance for fear of the torment inflicted on her. Weeping and mourning, they cry out, Alas, alas, great city, wearing fine linen, purple and scarlet, adorned in gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour this great wealth has been ruined. Every captain of a ship, every traveler at sea, sailors and seafaring merchants stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her pyre. What city could compare with the great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and mourning, Alas, alas, great city, in which all who had ships at sea grew rich from her wealth. In one hour she has been ruined. Rejoice over her heaven, you holy ones, apostles and prophets, for God has judged your case against her. A mighty angel picked up a stone like a huge millstone and threw it into the sea and said, With such force will Babylon the great city be thrown down and will never be found again. No melodies of harpists and musicians, flutists and trumpeters will ever be heard in you again. No craftsman in any trade will ever be found in you again. No sound of the millstone will ever be heard in you again. No light from a lamp will ever be seen in you again. No voices of bride and groom will ever be heard in you again. Because your merchants were the great ones of the world, all nations were led astray by your magic potion. In her was found the blood of prophets and holy ones and all who have been slain on the earth. Today we continue with chapter 18 and get even deeper into a consideration of commerce. There's this long list of luxury goods of all kinds. Interestingly, at the end of that list is slaves, human beings. That should give us a clue both to the essential, unethical, immoral nature of the system that is being described, uh, and also of a bigger picture of the way that people ultimately are mistreated when their value is assessed in any way other than as children of God. I also hear in this something about speculation and profit. Much of what, they're, what the writer lists here are goods that might have been bought in one place and then taken somewhere else and sold for a profit. So it's not even a matter of making and selling something or growing and selling something but rather trying to profit from that transaction that is, I think, part of the problem, part of what the writer of Revelation is trying to suggest is problematic in the way that it ends up, at least in some cases, exploiting those who need or want those goods and are obliged to pay more for them than perhaps they would otherwise. It's telling that merchants are the principal mourners here those who have benefited the most, those who have engaged in the most trade are the ones who are saddest to see the system go. All that said, I think the judgment here seems to be less of the things themselves, and clearly precious stones and incense and good quality wood and good quality cloth and these other things are valuable. They have their purpose and certainly have their place. We use many of them in the church to beautify the, the sanctuary, to beautify our services. So it's not necessarily a critique of things so much as it is of the desire for things, greed and pride and callousness. Those last two, particularly as they relate to the way that consuming those things can blind us to 
the simpler and more basic needs of other people. So once again, we are being called to look squarely at what God considers to be an appropriate way of valuing one another, which is to say, as images of Christ, as beloved children of God, and holding that up against what the world says about what it means to have $10 billion in the bank versus not knowing where your next meal is going to come from. Babylon, it seems, was valued for externals, for things that were showy, that were ways of saying, look how wealthy I am. Conspicuous consumption, we would say today. And that seems to be what is pared away. If we look toward the end of the lesson, we see images of, of ordinary life, music and the milling of grain and people being married, uh, a lamp being lit. These are very basic and homey sorts of images. That, I think, is being put up as a contrast to all of this flashy wealth at the beginning and is being pointed out as being more what it is we need to be working toward, what it is that we need to apply proper value to. Unfortunately, all that seems to be lost too. When the, the system collapses, all of those appropriate and worthy things are swept away with the wealth and with the power. And that's a shame. It, it says something about the way that the, the flaws and sins of this world can mar even that which is beautiful in, in the eyes of heaven. But ends with a reminder that there were warnings along the way. We were told these things in the, in the form of the prophets. It talks about that they found the blood of the prophets in Babylon. No, the prophets were there critiquing their societies as they saw them at the moment. And in many cases were killed for their trouble. Indeed, in some cases still are killed for their trouble. Overall, though, I think what we should see in this is not so much a critique of money per se, but rather how we use it. This is a fairly common message that has come down through the centuries in Christianity. Money is morally neutral. A lot depends on what use we put it to, whether we are building the kingdom of God, whether we're building some other kingdom, whether we're bringing life or whether we're bringing death. And when we can look those questions squarely in the eye and come up with answers that we would be more than willing to present before the throne of heaven, we will perhaps have learned the lesson of Babylon. <laughs> Well, yeah.